So um, I just want to start back here just to bring attention to the bookstore. Um, I've been doing books related to service learning since 1986. Don't think about that too much. Um, and um, so I brought books that I think will help you advance your service learning by getting kids engaged in reading things, reading stories, fiction, nonfiction, that will excite them and inspire them to want to do things in their world. So Katie, Kathy Akeem is helping here. So you don't even need to be able to pay today. You can take it, we'll bill you later. If anything interests you, please make sure you take a look before you leave. There's exceptional books here, um, really, for your use. I will be mentioning a few of them. One I brought that's a little different, though, is um, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to eat it anymore. I love the title. It's about what's going on with food around us. And I, I brought this book in because one of the resources, I don't know if you saw this yet, but there's resources on your green sheet. If you open up your resource list on the uh, page under environment toward the bottom, it says Water Planet Challenge. So it's the page under environment and gardens. If you go down to Water Planet Challenge, um, I've written some action guides for this program. And one, my newest one is called What's on Your Fork? It's an action guide to help young people think about Meatless Monday campaigns. So if any of that interests you, grab this book, go to the website, free action guides to download, and lots of good resources up here. So we decided this year from our advisory group to focus on youth voice and choice and how to really build that in service learning. And one of the reasons I like to talk about this is very often I go in and I see service learning, I do travel around the globe and help make it happen and help get things going. But very often when I look at what's going on out there, who do you think does most of the work, the students or the teachers? Thank you very much. We need to switch that. But if we, if we really think about it, we can. Now, this may mean some of us have to let go of control. How many of you are willing to admit that most teachers are control freaks? <laughs> Admission is the first step to recovery, so you're in good shape. So, what we want to do with service learning is release some of that. So, last June, I was asked to give a keynote uh, at a conference in Texas where I was going for years, and they said, Can you talk about dropout rates? Everything they mentioned was putting me to sleep. I said, I really don't want to do those topics. Not that they're not important. That's not what I've been thinking about. I've been thinking for several years about this issue of trust and why trust is so critical in schools today and why it's not really there as much as I think it needs to be there. And that means from the top down. I mean, there's a lot of trust that's missing. You think of how our federal government and education may not trust our states, our schools. You know what I'm talking about, right? We see a lot of it. So what do we need to think about trust? So everybody should have handouts. Everybody should have handouts in front of them. Everybody in the handouts in front of people. On the first handout, on the first page, it says the youth we trust, and then there's a place to write something down. It says three words for trust. I want each of you now to take a moment. In service learning terms, we call it reflection. I want you to take a moment and jot down three words that come to mind when you hear the word trust. What are three words that come to mind when you hear the word trust? You can talk to someone about it or write down your own word. What are three words that come to mind for you when you hear the word trust? We've got seats here. We've got seats over there. Write down three words that come to mind when you hear the word trust. First words. First thoughts. All right? Now, here's the game we're going to play. As I'm talking about, I am going to talk for a little bit about this concept of trust and what I've explored. If you hear one of the words I'm, that you wrote down mentioned in the comments I'm making, the first time you hear it, just raise your hand. And we'll see who's writing the same words. So if you hear me mention the word you're hearing now, just raise your hand. You have to do it every time it's not one of those things. <laughs> but the first time you hear it. And then we'll see what we're thinking about when we look at the when I was doing research on this, um, and I keep researching it, I found several definitions of trust I found to be interesting. Willingness to be vulnerable based on confidence that the other party is benevolent, reliable, confident, honest, and open. Wow, that honest got a lot of people. <laughs> trust. I also saw that it's acting always with honesty and integrity and without hidden agendas. I love that one, without hidden agendas. Do you think people in LA generally have hidden agenda numbers? <laughs> <laughs> Openness and communication with everyone. Keeping your promises. Oh my gosh, what a thought. Meeting your obligations to look out for other people's interests as well as your own. Interesting. That's the nature of trust. 
One of the things that's dominating our schools, and this is everywhere in the world, uh, independent schools, public schools, international schools, all over, um, I see that the dominant factor over, between, well, let me ask you something. What's more dominant in your schools today? Intrinsic rewards or extrinsic rewards? How many think extrinsic? Gosh, we've got some really good folks here. How many think maybe intrinsic? Well, you're moving in the right direction. Generally in the populace, what do you think it is? Extrinsic. And it comes in lots of shapes, colors, and sizes. So for example, with the food drive, the class that brings in the most food gets what? Pizza party. Which means you're thinking about who? Themselves rather than the issue of hunger. That is a lose-lose right away. You have to remove those things. It also comes in the form of programs like Hot Being Good. How many of you heard of those kind of programs? Where kids, um, and I've seen this in grade K through 12. I love that you look at me shocked because I'm so glad you don't know about that. It's called Hot Being Good. So in Hot Being Good programs, if I see a child open the door for a teacher, they get a ticket, you get a prize. So what are we teaching kids when we do that? You get a prize or you know, if you do something. Now when I was a kid growing up, if my friend forgot the lunch, what would we naturally do? Sure. sure. But if you have a pot food program, what does a kid always do before they share the lunch? Make sure somebody is watching. This is all this is all stuff. <laughs> so I help deconstruct those programs. And part of it's there is that teachers don't think or schools don't think that kids will do what's best. They won't do what they think is right. It undermines our belief in, in what? The kids and trusting them. So I think we have to replace extrinsic with intrinsic. And as we do, we're building a, a community where trust is alive. Now, one of the books that's influenced me, and that's why I brought some of the books to, to share with you, is that as I was looking into this, I picked up a copy of the book Drive by Daniel King. How many of you read things by Daniel King? He's such a great writer. He also has TED Talks on this topic, which I haven't watched, but people say are fabulous. This book is on the surprising truth about what motivates us. And it talks about business, it talks about schools, it talks about lots of things. So I'm just going to share with you a little of what's in here. He says rewards, or short, short term boosts like a cup of coffee. You know, it feels good for the jolt, but it doesn't really take you anywhere. It doesn't last long. So it actually reduces long term motivation. Isn't that interesting? It actually backfires. He says short-term incentive plan, plans and paid for performance programs get people more looking at their checkbook than looking at what's really going on. That sometimes if they give something at the end of it, just, wow, you did such a great job, here's a you know, $100 certificate for dinner somewhere, those work, but putting it up front actually interferes with the creative process. Um, so, worse of all, he says, oh, I've got to read it. He says, I love this part. Oh, where did I get to? Oh, here. He says, talked about these short term incentive plans. He says, worse, these practices have infiltrated our schools where we ply our future workforce with iPods cash, and pizza coupons so it, to incentivize them to learn. Something has gone wrong. Oh, no. Oh, no. Very good. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, <laughs> so what's going on right now is these kinds of extrinsic and these kind of controlling things create a situation where we are always looking how do you control and manage teacher education programs, how do you control and manage kids. I was speaking, I was keynoting at a character ed partnership conferences about a year and a half ago, and I was going around to a lot of workshops before my keynote. And even at a character ed conference, we were talking about how do you control and manage kids. How many of you, when you were a kid in school, wanted to be controlled and managed? <laughs> how many of you really are excited about being controlled and managed now? <laughs> so we're doing something really, what I would call in a group of friends, back ass you know? So I think we want to really replace this concept of control and manage with to engage and inspire. If we engage and inspire young people, we don't have to control and manage. Because they're engaged. Can we just 